So tell me, how did you guys uh, find the titrations? Were they manageable? Lab four titrations? Okay. Now, um, in that those titrations, right? What we were doing again is we were um, performing a reaction between two chemicals. Um, it was sodium carbonate and HCl hydrochloric acid. And we were monitoring the reaction with a dye that would change colors at different pHs, right? Different hydrogen ion concentrations, okay? Um, we should have a little conversation. Uh, we didn't really get to have a conversation last class when we were preparing for this, but we should have a conversation about what pH means. Um, let me finish up this reaction first. So we have sodium chloride, right? Cation going with the anion. And then this cation, H hydrogen, going with the carbonate ion, right? And to balance this, we need to put a couple of twos there like that. And so this was the chemical reaction that we were performing. Um, we performed it in two steps. Well, I mean, it actually occurs in two steps when you were just adding small amounts of HCl gradually to a solution of sodium carbonate. Um, initially, the sodium carbonate is converted to sodium bicarbonate, and then the sodium bicarbonate interacts with another HCl and is converted to sodium chloride and carbonic acid, right? Uh, so this is a, a little bit of a, a review about what we did. And um, when we talk about um, acids, something like HCO, going into solution, forming H plus and Cl minus when it dissociates, right? HCl is a strong acid. So you can say that whatever the concentration of hydrogen ion is, or hydro hydrochloric acid, the concentration of hydrogen ion will be the same. All right, give me a thumbs up if that makes sense. The concentration of hydrochloric acid relates directly to the hydrogen ion concentration because HCl is a strong acid, therefore it completely dissociates. Do you guys understand that? You want to give me a thumbs up if that makes sense? Okay, Audrey's got that. Ethan, does that make sense? Excellent. Okay, so um, when we talk about hydrogen ion concentration, uh, pH is the, the tool that we use to express the hydrogen ion concentration. Now, the hydrogen ion concentration um, impacts chemical reactions um, drastically, even if it's a relatively small change. So pH is a tool, again, that we use to express concentration of hydrogen ion. All right, and this little bracket right here means the molar concentration of hydrogen. But it's not directly related. pH is not the molar concentration of hydrogen ion. And again, big M molar equals moles of hydrogen ion per liter of solution. That's what molar of hydrogen ion would mean. And this that's what this is expressing, the molar concentration of hydrogen ion. pH isn't equal directly to that. It's actually equal to what we call the negative log, right? Now, what that does for us is it allows us to express a concentration change over a very wide range, all right? Do you guys remember the kind of, I think you guys, I saw um, some of your guys' comments about the range at which the pH changes. And it's usually, we think of pH in aqueous solutions as ranging between one and, and 14. Okay, so um, if pH is 1, that means that the um, negative log of x, if you wanted to identify what the hydrogen ion concentration is, pH was 1, this is uh, 0. 0. So if pH is 1, then your, no, 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 sorry. If pH is 1, your x here is 0 0.1. So the negative log of 0 0.1, that is 1. 
if you have that's your hydrogen ion concentration if you have a uh, um, hydrogen ion concentration of one molar then the negative log of one anybody have a calculator there can you guys identify what the negative log of one is You can type it down below there if you find it. Zero. That's right. The negative log of one is zero. So your pH is zero if you have a one molar solution of HCl. Now we just said that the general range is one to 14. So you see that when we talk about ranges of one to 14, we're not talking about very high concentrations of hydrogen ion. It's all negative 1 to 14 is the highest, sorry, pH range of 1 to 14. The highest concentration here is 0 0.1 molar. And the lowest concentration here is 1 times 10 to the minus 14 molar hydrogen ion concentration, which is 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 molar hydrogen ion. Okay, so these are reasonable ranges to expect to have a hydrogen ion concentration. And this is very small. This isn't that large itself, 0.1, right? Yet we need to be aware of that range, and um, that range is impactful on the uh, chemical reactions and so forth. So anyway, these are things that we have to, we want to be aware of. Um, so... When we talk about the pH, really it's just a function. Some people say pH means power of hydrogen, but that's not a good, rep a good ex um, expression for what pH is. pH is just a mathematical function, like um, uh, P of X or uh, F of X, right? We use that in terms of, um, in math class sometimes. And so this is just a function, and it's P of H. And you could say PX, and then that would just be the negative log of whatever you're, you're talking about there. Okay. So PH relates to the hydrogen ion, ion concentration in this way. So um, this is again all kind of this is review up here this is something that you probably have heard before but we're just we want to make sure that everybody is kind of familiar with how ph works um titrations are not limited to just ph though so titrations between acids and bases are typically what thought of but you can do titrations in many ways and this lab is a, a what we call a precipitation titration and um, in the precipitation titration, we're going to be reacting silver nitrate, right, with sodium chloride, and we're going to form silver chloride, okay? So this, what we have written down here, is the net ionic equation, but we can think of the uh, ionic equation or the molecular equation first silver nitrate plus sodium chloride to form silver chloride and sodium nitrate this is soluble this silver nitrate is soluble aqueous sodium chloride is soluble aqueous Silver chloride is the precipitate, insoluble. I'm going to write the ionic equation, silver ion, nitrate ion, sodium ion, chloride ion. Silver chloride, insoluble, stays as it is in the ionic equation, sodium ion, and nitrate ion. All right. And then our net ionic equation is, again, what's drawn down here below. The nitrate it hasn't changed, and the sodium ion hasn't done any chemistry either. So we have silver ion and chloride ion coming together to form silver chloride. All right. So um, 
it's nice to just think of this, to simplify this in terms of the net ionic equation, because the source of the chloride doesn't need to be sodium, right? Maybe instead of sodium chloride, we had some potassium chloride in solution. Well, potassium chloride is just as soluble, and so the chloride ion is going to be floating around. Maybe it was magnesium chloride, right? Magnesium chloride, just as soluble, so the chloride ions will be floating around, all right? So in a titration, from a titration's perspective, if we can tell when all the chloride ion is taken up, uh, then we'll know that we've added enough silver ion to take up all that chloride ion, and we, and we can use our known concentration of silver ion to determine how much chloride ion was in solution. All right. And the way that we're going to do that is with a, a dye that kind of likes to bind to um, solid surfaces solid surfaces. So some dyes actually bind to the surface of precipitates, and that allows us to use these dyes to detect precipitates. And the precipitation can be used to indicate the concentration of the chloride ion in solution. Okay, so what we do in the lab here is we set up a titration apparatus just like in lab four, including the burette, the ring stand, stir plate, we're going to use an Erlenmeyer flask. All right, all very similar. So I'll draw a little picture to kind of remind us what's going on here. So we have a, a burette, right? We have an Erlenmeyer flask. Uh, we have a stir bar in there. We have a stir plate. We only turn on the stirring, not the heat, right? We have, what else do we have? A ring stand, which is holding this up. Um, and the indicator that we're going to use is a indicator or chemical called dichlorofluorescein. Dichlorofluorescein, okay? So the first thing we want to do is we want to calculate the volume of titrant silver ion solution, and that's what is going to go into this in here. We're going to calculate how, what volume of that would be required to titrate 100 milliliters of a 50 part per million standard solution. All right. Now, in this case, we have a, a standard uh, let's see. Calculate the volume of titrant that will be required to titrate 100 milliliters of 50 part per million standard solution. So it's a 50, mile, 50 uh, part per million standard solution of chloride ion. All right. So we're going to provide you with um, a 50 part per million chloride ion solution. All right. 50 part per million chloride ion solution. And we want to know what volume of our silver ion solution, um, and the silver ion solution that we're going to use is 1,000 parts per million, right? And the, um, we're going to titrate 100, 100 milliliters of this 50 part per million chloride solution, all right? Now the solution or the, the stoichiometry of the reaction is one mole of silver ion to one mole of chloride ion. All right. Um, but that, you know, when we talk about parts per million, the units for parts per million, we talked about it a while ago, but we'll have to kind of refresh our memory, right? Parts per million. If I say 10 parts per million, what that means is 10 milligrams of solute for every liter of solution. All right, so parts per million is milligrams of solute per liter of solution. So that becomes a little bit of a tricky calculation there, but I'd like you guys to do that as homework and become familiar with how to do that. 
calculate the volume of titrant, the silver ion solution, which is a thousand parts per million, that will be required to titrate 100 milliliters of a 50 part per million standard solution of chloride ion. All right. And with this calculation and with the 100 milliliters of 50 parts per million, we're going to practice titrating these 100 milliliter samples until you can see the color change occur at the volume you calculated. All right. And the reason for this is because like any titration, this, this titration you have to be kind of become familiar with. And you can do that by performing um, practices with a standard that you have. All right. So once you've practiced with the standard, and I would do it, you know, about two or three times until you can, are confident that you are seeing the color change that you're supposed to be seeing. Now we're going to titrate a sample of tap water by adding 100 milliliters of tap water into an Erlenmeyer flask. Uh, about three drops of indicator is probably good. And, you know, that's how many drops you can probably, you want to use probably the same amount of drops as you use up, uh, above and the, whatever you used above and could see a good color change with, you're going to want to use that again. Okay. Um, and then you're going to want to repeat this four times and determine the average and standard deviation for the chloride ion concentration in tap water. All right. So we're trying to find out what the chloride ion of, of uh, what the chloride ion concentration is in tap water. And then, let's see, this actually needs to go up to a superscript. There we go. And then we're going to repeat the process for a half a milliliter of water from the ocean. All right. So if we put about a half a milliliter of ocean water in and about 95 milliliters of deionized water, and we perform the titration again about four times and get an average of standard deviation, it will be a way for us to determine what our, again, parts per million of chloride ion is in the, uh, the ocean water. So we essentially have two unknowns. We don't know what the chloride ion concentration is in tap water, and we don't know what the chloride ion is in ocean water, but we're going to figure those out, okay? And we have this 50 part per million chloride ion solution uh, control. And I'm telling you that it's probably a good idea to use 100 milliliters of that sample. And uh, from that, you'll be able to get familiar with the kind of color change that we should be seeing for our um, dichlorofluorescein solution. All right. So that's how this uh, titration is going to proceed. Did you have any questions, Ethan? Um, not any right now. I can think of. Um, this does seem like a a shorter lab, though. For sure. Yeah, I it's. Was wondering. It's 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 possible that you'll be able to finish it quicker. Um, okay. What so what it provides for students is a good preparation for the final because in the final you're going to be performing a titration that is new to you and um, this is an opportunity to kind of um, again get a little more experience with the titration in which you are not familiar with it you've provided a standard and you're provided um, when you're trying to find out the concentration of chloride ion in these two unknowns. And, uh, you know, I think that what this does is hopefully will show you the importance of figuring out using your standard and uh, getting an average and a good standard deviation. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I don't have any other further questions about it, but it's all making a lot of sense. Okay. Well, good. So um, I think that's it. Um, and uh, after that, 
maybe we look here at the pull up the See how our schedule is going. Oh yeah, so you mentioned rescheduling their lab and then moving the final back. Is that what we're probably going to do? I don't really know. We'll have to kind of okay. look into it. I, I, I think that that would probably be unlikely. But um, okay. um, one thing that we could do is instead of having, well, so because lab five is short, we could mm -hmm perform their precipitation lab on March 30th and then have the representation at about 150 on March 30th. So they would do lab on the first half and then recitation for the final on the second half. All together, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That's a possibility. Yeah, everybody together. So uh, we are Coming down to the last couple of weeks, though, right? So we got the yeah. 16th. That's the next where you guys are going to be performing Lab 5. And uh, the yeah. 23rd, your group is going to have a break. You don't have anything to do. To do. And then um, the 30th is the date that we'll go over the recitation for the final lab. And then... Um, practice, oh, practical exam, yeah on April 6th, which is a, about a week before your finals, and that gives us a little extra room to focus on finals. So that's why we usually do that for nice. labs. Yeah, that's perfect. Sounds good to me. Okay, so yeah, for you guys, I think it'll just be the 16th, the 30th, and the 6th, just like that. For the other wow. group, it'll probably be the 16th will be their lab four. Or no, let's see. Yeah, yeah. 16th will be their lab four. And the 23rd will be their recitation. And then the 30th would be their lab five. And we'll also have recitation after their lab five. So, okay. Well, looks like we lost. Um, who did we have? Um, oh, Audrey. Audrey, yeah, we lost Audrey. McKen okay. Mackenzie said that she couldn't make it, but we're recording this, so hopefully they can watch it. Sweet. Yeah, that's what ended up happening last week. Yeah. <laughs> I was there, and then it was a little bit later, and so I ended up watching the recording because I missed oh, the right, right, right. last part. But thank you. Okay. Anything else, Ethan, that you want to talk about? Um, nothing right now. Okay. Sounds good. We'll be in touch. See you next week. Sounds good. Yep, see ya. Bye-bye.